So let's see. It's a circular thing, like all things are, contrary to what they teach us. And um, it really started way, way back with the uh, oh, Euro-Americans coming to this continent. And things just got worse from there on out. And, uh, you know, if six was nine, Jimi Hendrix, that's pretty much how, how things went down. But anyway, around uh, 1968, um, the American Indian movement was uh, kicking into high gear uh, with people like Dennis Banks and uh, John Trudell and Russell Means, who were their leaders and founders, and the Bellacourt brothers. And um, you can read a lot about them. I brought the, did you put the books out at night? No, not yet. No, uh, I brought some books just so you could see them, and they're, they're um, really good information on them. In the Spirit of Crazy Horses, an excellent uh, book by Peter Matherson. And, um, you know, it really, I mean, I read that on my, way, my first trip to Pine Ridge Reservation back in 1983. And I got there, and I started talking to the locals, and, of course, uh, you know, Leonard being arrested and everything that went down with him uh, at Agala um, had happened recently, of course. And um, Leonard, uh, uh, you know, and the people on the res just did not trust anybody that was white. So uh, it was kind of took a while to get their trust and for them to realize I wasn't with the government. And which was a drag for me, but I understood it. But anyway, I kept, you know, I kept regurgitating things that I had read because I literally finished the book as I hit the res. And I mean, they were like, "How do you know that?" And you know, I said, "Well, I read it in this book and everything." So it was pretty accurate, and I had it fact checked that way. And uh, was it, later on, I got to go to uh, Yellow Thunder Camp, uh, stayed in the AIM office in Rapid City, courtesy of uh, Russell Means himself, and. Um, uh, that was the beginning of my involvement and understanding, I guess. Uh, I had been following a lot of what they were doing. Uh, they took over Assateague Island back in, I guess that was 67, 68. And uh, anyway, uh, Wounded Knee happened in 1973, and uh, the American Indian Movement took over the little hamlet of Wounded Knee, which is the location of the massacre at Wounded Knee, where the Seven, the remnants of the Seventh Cavalry that was George Custer's uh, unit uh, massacred about 300 Lakota, mostly women and children and you know older uh, people, and uh, left them to freeze and die in the in the uh, frozen snow. And there's that famous picture of Chief Bigfoot uh, propping himself up on an elbow. And uh, he froze like that. And it's pretty weird to see that picture. But um, they threw all the bodies into a mass grave. And so when Leonard and, uh, well, when the American Indian Movement, uh, you know, wanted to symbolically take over someplace, they went to Wounded Knee. Everybody was expecting a, a clash between what they called the progressives, which basically just meant the Indians on the res that were, generally speaking, you know, mixed bloods and they held all the political offices and they uh, centered themselves right around the town of Pine Ridge and uh, ran the government and all the jobs were given to people that were related to those officials. And uh, anyway, uh, they expected them to have a clash, uh, the, the traditionals, which is what the AIM people were supporting, the um, uh, Fool's Crows and Matthew Kings. Uh, we're sorry, by the way, that Harvey Arden couldn't be here tonight. Uh, he had an accident with his foot and wasn't able to walk. But uh, Harvey's written pretty extensively and interviewed uh, Matthew King in a book called Noble Red Man. So if you're interested in that, it's another good book. Um, but uh, um, they wound up bypassing the main office there at Pine Ridge and they drove right on to Wounded Knee and they held Wounded Knee for 73 days. And I, you know, you can't, that's pretty amazing in this country. That'll um, be on the test. Yeah, that'll be on the test. And they were surrounded by, you know, the Army and Navy and Air Force and everybody else. And they had um, personnel carriers, tanks. Um, th is that right? Personnel, is that what you call them? Personnel carriers? Yeah. Okay, and there are tanks, in effect, and, and uh, they were uh, 
supplying the goons, which was the guardians of the Aglala Nation, which was the progressives, quote unquote. Um, they were supplying them with arms and uh, I think there was something like 63 murders that went unsolved uh, or if they were solved it was um, they committed suicide when they've been shot in the back kind of hard to do and um, so all this led up to wounded knee wounded knee happened and things were pretty tense and that calmed down and AIM stayed on the res to help and they were doing things like the Black Panthers did with the food kitchens and schools and you know teaching and uh, uh, helping elders get from outside the res you know or outside the Pine Ridge in to get their you know annuities and things like that and uh, they were on a family uh, called Jumping Bulls property and um, they had a camp set up there where they were doing more of this you know, training and teaching and stuff. And uh, two FBI agents came there uh, under the guise of trying to arrest somebody who had stolen a $150 pair of boots. And uh, a gun battle ensued. And nobody knows really who started it. And two FBI agents were dead. And uh, one Native American, Joe Stunts, was killed. And uh, so that's uh, how that went down, and three people were charged. Thank you. Three people were charged with, uh, yes, yeah, since they don't drink too much or they try not to. The traditionals frowned on that. You know, I got my get out of jail free card there because I'm white. You know, so. Um, but but uh, the three individuals were charged with the death of the two um, uh, FBI agents and uh, two of them were tried separately from Leonard Peltier and they were acquitted by I think an all-white jury or it was majority white jury and the self-defense was the you know the reason that they were acquitted and so the FBI proceeded to get they needed to get somebody so they hunted uh, Peltier down who had fled to Canada and uh, forged a bunch of documents and falsified uh, documents uh, intimidated witnesses to testify that they knew he was the one that shot the gun that killed the FBI agents and etc 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 they brought him back from Canada tried him and he's serving two life term sentences I think right now he's in uh, Pennsylvania prison federal prison and uh, so everybody you know every time they bring it up all the defense committees and stuff they talk about uh, you know all the evidence and it wasn't the gun, his gun was not the gun uh, that would have, you know, fired the bullets that killed the, uh, the FBI agents and things like that. But my take on it is there was a civil war going on on the res between the traditionals who wanted to hang on to the Lakota Way and the progressives who wanted to sell out to GE and Exxon and Shell and all those cats. And, um, the FBI decided to take the side of the progressives because it was, uh, what, what do they call that? Um, national security. And uh, they, uh, they, as I said earlier, they uh, armed and had intelligence information for the, uh, for the uh, goon squads. And uh, the rest is pretty much history. Uh, but my take is that there's a war going on People get killed in wars, and I'm sorry the FBI agents got killed. I'm sorry Joe Stunts got killed. Um, but Leonard's not a criminal and doesn't deserve to be in prison. So, David Salyer's on mandolin, and we're going to do a couple songs, and then Ron's going to come up and do some poetry. <laughs> 